Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist at EarningsBeats.com, and this is Trading Places Live. It is Tuesday, November 30th, 2021, and I'm pre-recording this uh, Trading Places Live for just a little bit later this morning. Um, currently, we've got futures uh, down, uh, more um, fears, I guess, over the uh, Omicron uh, mutation or the virus, the new variant that's out. And uh, we're just going to have some, you know, we're going to have to deal with this for a period of time. It's very difficult to say day to day what the uh, headlines are going to be. Uh, I think some days we're going to wake up to red, some days we're going to wake up to green, and uh, that's just going to be the new, uh, the new market uh, that we're dealing with with this uh, new uh, COVID-19 variant and the uh, recent breakout in various countries around the world. Uh, we just don't know enough about the virus, and you know I could talk about it all day long, but I don't have knowledge. So I just look at how it affects the market, and anytime you have uncertainties, you've got to be careful because uh, that's you know typically what takes the market down, at least in the short term, is uncertainty. Market doesn't like uncertainty. Anyhow, <clears throat> we won't spend a whole lot of time on that. Just the fact that we got to be aware that there are going to be some ramifications in the short term. And we're not going to like waking up and seeing futures some mornings. And uh, today is one of those days. Currently, and this could change by the time uh, the market actually opens, but currently I'm showing Dow futures down about 300. S&P 500 futures down 33. NASDAQ futures down 61. On a relative basis, NASDAQ doing better. Um, but that's what we saw throughout the pandemic in 2020. We saw uh, better performance in NASDAQ stocks. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into talking technically uh, a bit later. In fact, let's go through that agenda for today. We're gonna start off as we always do with the daily market recap, then we'll get into talking technically. Uh, I wanna take a look at relative strength. We'll start with sectors and go through maybe a few of the industry groups. Then uh, earnings spotlight, and we'll wrap up the show with the three you must see. Before we do any of that though, let me take you over to earningsbeats.com. For those of you who are new, if you simply scroll down Actually, I'm going to refresh this. We had a fall special up, uh, but that actually ended yesterday. I do want to thank all of our members at Earnings Beats for uh, your continued support. We had a huge percentage of our uh, membership take us up on our offer to extend over the next up to uh, three years um, with a fourth year free. Um, that went great. And uh, again, just want to thank all of our members uh, for helping us. Um, you know, continue to provide you the guidance and the research and uh, the education that we do here at Earnings Beats. We're really thankful. All right, uh, moving on though, as you roll down or scroll down the uh, website, you'll see we have this uh, area right here where you can subscribe to our free Earnings Beats Digest newsletter. I publish this Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, so three times a week. Normally, it's out by about 8.30 or so in the morning. We want to try to get it out about an hour before the market opens. It's normally just a couple of paragraphs and a chart um, focused on earnings, relative strength, candlesticks, reversals, uh, those types of things. Things that are really important to us in our trading and investing at uh, Earnings Beats. Uh, so if you'd like to, to uh, subscribe and, and begin receiving this three times a week, just go in here, type in your name, email address, hit the subscribe button. There's absolutely no credit card required. You can unsubscribe at any time. This is a legitimately free way to, uh, to learn a little bit more about how we look at the market at earnings beat. So we'd love to have you. All right, moving on, taking a look at the action on Monday. Well, it was a reprieve for the bulls after Friday's massacre. Uh, I shouldn't say massacre. I mean, we've been moving higher quite a bit over the last several months, last several years. Um, and so to sell off and still be in an uptrend, I mean, we should still be pretty thankful for this uh, market that we've had over the last several years, but it was still nonetheless a pretty big down day on Friday, but we rebounded yesterday. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up 237 points, S&P up 61, NASDAQ up 291. So on a relative basis, you could definitely see the strength there. Mid caps and small caps have been underperforming. You can see their performance um, really looks very similar to the chart of the Dow. Seems like, you know, over the last couple of years, the NASDAQ's led, the S&P 500 has been a little bit behind. And then you've got the Dow mid caps and small caps all performing very similarly. I mean, their charts look eerily similar. Um, and it's kind of strange because 
large caps or you know the the Dow, we're talking about these behemoth giant companies, and then you got some mid caps and small caps, which are you know quite the opposite. Uh, but yet their charts look very similar. Anyhow, um, didn't really see the strength in the mid caps and small caps yesterday, but we did get a nice bounce, especially in the Nasdaq. And of course, when you think Nasdaq, at least when I think Nasdaq, I'm thinking technology, consumer discretionary, and right there were the two groups leading the rally on Monday. Te uh, technology up two and a half percent, discretionary up more than one and a half percent. So uh, there was your leadership. But we also saw utilities gaining almost one and a half percent, real estate up one and a quarter. In fact, all 11 groups, which went lower on Friday, all 11 sectors went higher yesterday. Um, worst performer, though, was the industrial group, gaining a little less than two-tenths of 1%. So uh, when you look at the Dow and you look at mid caps, small caps, so forth, I think the, the industrial chart looks very similar, kind of rides right along with those. So we didn't get much participation in the way of, uh, at least on a relative basis, on the Dow, mid caps, small caps. Same was true for industrials. All right, 10-year Treasury yield. Um, well, we finished yesterday at 1.53%. Uh, we gapped up on the yield, meaning we gapped down in Treasury. So there was a sell-off in Treasuries at the open. That was after a huge run to the upside in Treasuries on Friday. Um, so a lot of folks looking for safety, and they found it in uh, the Treasury market. And of course, when everyone's buying Treasuries, Treasury prices go up, yields come down. That's where you see this big gap down and the huge red candle there. We went from about 1.64% to maybe 1.48. So we we're down about 15, 16 basis points on Friday. Well, we rebounded and got back about a third of that, got back five basis points yesterday, finishing at 1.53%. Um, I know this morning with our futures down, uh, yields are also falling, very similar to what we saw on Friday. So last time I looked, we were down about 10 basis points on the 10 year treasury yield. And uh, Looks like we're going to go down and test this level and possibly even go down to the breakout area around 1.37, 1.38% uh, that we saw back in February. That's where we got that breakout. So we haven't gone back down to test that breakout. This could be our opportunity here. Um, a move back below 137 or 138, um, I think that's going to pose some problems for the overall market. Because any dollar, you know, as the yields go down, that's telling us money's rotating into bonds. Any, any dollar that goes into bonds is a dollar that's not going into stocks. This is, you know, these are two different asset classes that portfolio managers or even individual investors uh, have to decide. You know, they have a limited number of dollars. Where are they going to put them? Well, when, when money's going into yield or into treasury, sending yields lower, that is money that is not going into the stock market. So we don't always go down in the stock market when we're going down the yield, especially during a secular bull market. But normally we're going to see more choppy action. And when the yields are rising, that's when we're typically going to see the best uh, market action because money's coming out of the bond market. And so you have more dollars to drive equities. Um, economic reports out later today. Uh, we've got the September Case-Shiller Home Price Index. Uh, that's expected to rise 1.1%. August rose 1.4%. So we're looking for just a little pullback, although it should be a positive number. September FHFA house price index also expected to rise uh, to this morning 1%. Uh, August was also 1%. So we're just looking for a very consistent number there. November Chicago PMI 68.4 is the estimate. October was 68.4. So again, uh, just looking for a consistent level there. November consumer confidence. 110.7 is the expectation. October was actually 113.8, so looking for a little bit of a decline in consumer confidence later this morning. All right, moving on to uh, talking technically. What I want to focus on here, this is a two-year chart, and this is the NASDAQ 100 versus the S&P 500, and I did it QQQ versus the SPY. Then on the bottom panel is the IWF versus the IWD, which is growth versus value. Now, I look at the QQQ versus the spider as growth versus value as well. And if you look at these two charts, I think you'll see they're pretty similar. So when growth is leading, we tend to see pretty good performance out of the NASDAQ, at least on a relative basis uh, versus the S&P 500. So the point of bringing this up 
is when you look at the last two years, I only see one period of time when the QQQ was rapidly declining versus the S&P 500 back February through May. And I also only saw one period on the IWF. Now we had already started declining a little bit starting in September. We had such a huge run up in growth versus value. Started just to consolidate, but the, the bigger part of the decline was February to May right here from this top down to this low. Actually, it's a double bottom, really from this top to this low. Uh, this was more sideways consolidation. But the reason I bring this up is this was when we had the first shocking inflation reports. Because if you recall, you know, inflation, you're looking at prices, um, you know, going back in time. So you're looking at where we are today in prices versus where we were. Well, if you remember February, March, April, and May, this period was as we were going, heading into the, um, the pandemic, we closed down the economy, shut off supply, prices were dropping. I mean, remember crude oil prices, crude oil prices went negative. You, if you had an empty swimming pool, they would pay you to put crude oil in your swimming pool to store it. That's how low prices were going back at that time. And so what we saw, and it, it was unprecedented, we had three consecutive months where we saw the CP, I think it was the CPI decline, go down month over month, three months in a row. Well, the problem is, you know, when you start looking at the annual inflation rate, you get into February, March, April, and May the following year, the comparisons are what we had back in 2020, which were declines, which almost never happened. So when we got into February through May, of course, everything's picking back up, the economy's strengthening. So we're rushing to try to get supply back up. And so what's happening? Demand is outstripping supply. We couldn't get up, you know, catch up fast enough. And so prices were rising rapidly, much more than they normally would. It was a pandemic related effect the next year. And so all of a sudden, we were getting these headline numbers on inflation that were suggesting, my gosh, we, this is going to be Armageddon. Uh, we got hyperinflation. Well, we really didn't. And I don't believe we do going forward. There's still a lot of talk about inflation. I don't believe it's a problem. But we're going to find out. I mean, uh, you know, I believe, you know, just from what I know about the market, know, what I know about our economy, that it's taking a while for the supply to catch up. And I don't even, I still don't know that we're there because it's not normal demand. It's actually excessive demand because no one could do anything in 2020. So all of a sudden everyone wants to spend money in 2021 and we don't have the supply. So you got a lot of money chasing a uh, smaller supply. That's economics 101. That's going to drive inflation for a period of time. Now, what I like to do is not pay attention to the media headlines but I like to pay attention to what Wall Street is saying. Here, from February to May, I would say Wall Street is saying, hey, we got to reevaluate things here. We got inflation problems. And so growth stocks, if you recall, our portfolios at earnings beats were horrible. I'll be honest, as, as good as they've been for the last few years, for this three month period, they were horrible. And we were focused on growth. That's how I know growth was really struggling for those three months because our portfolios trailed the S&P 500 by a mile. Um, and so Wall Street at that point in time was trying to reevaluate re things based on these new inflation um, you know, metrics and so forth, these reports that were coming out that were highly showing you know, really high inflation that was picking up rapidly. And so that immediately ate into um, the valuations of many growth stocks. Because growth, you don't really want to own growth stocks in, an, in a high inflationary environment because all of those future growth that what's driving the valuation is eaten away by inflation. So you're not earning what you think because inflation eats away at it. So that's what was driving both the QQQ, NASDAQ versus the S&P lower. And that's also what was driving growth versus value lower. Now let's fast forward. Let's take a look at what's been going on. We still got inflation talk. Everybody's still talking about inflation and how, you know, we've got issues going forward and this inflation is going to be problematic, blah, blah, blah. You see the headlines from time to time. Well, look at what Wall Street's saying. Wall Street's saying, you know what? We don't think inflation's a problem. 
we're pouring our money back into uh, the NASDAQ versus the S&P 500. You can see us going back up. We're back up right now near an all-time high on this relative ratio. How about growth versus value since May? Look at this move back up. Now we're not back to the high, but we're pretty darn close. And there'll be some will say, well, yeah, but we, we're not, we haven't broken out yet on either one. So that's bad. No, it's really not. not. You know, Amazon after doubling in six months has gone sideways for the last year. I, personally, I don't think that's a bad thing about Amazon. It's consolidating. It made a huge advance. Let's go back, you know, five years. I want you to look at this run that was made. Look at this straight up move made by the NASDAQ versus the S&P. Look at this straight up move during the pandemic, growth stocks versus value. We needed a period of consolidation and that's what we've gotten. But right now we're on an uptrend. And if we make these breakouts, definitive breakouts, forget about inflation. That's what the stock market's telling us. Forget about inflation. All right, let's move on. Um, I wanna talk about relative strength for a couple minutes here. So looking at relative strength, what we do at Earnings Beats, we provide our members, if you're an extra or pro member over at Stock Charts, we actually provide a lot of research that you can download directly into your account at Stock Charts. Now, if you're a basic member at Stock Charts, you're only allowed to have one chart list. So you get a default chart list, but you can't download ours because you already have one and you're using it. It's a default. You can't replace the default chart list with anything we do. So if you want to take advantage of what we do at Earnings Beats um, and you're not currently a member of either one, take out a free trial for both of us. You know, Stock Charts has a 30 day free trial, so do we. But you can take um, many of our chart lists and download them. Now, this is one of the few chart lists that we have that we only, that we reserve for our annual members. Because once you get this chart list, there's no updating it. You'll have it forever. So we like to get, have our members commit to us for at least a year's service before we uh, allow the, this and a couple of others to be downloaded. Mostly it's this and, and a lot of our Excel spreadsheets where we put a lot of time and effort in. Um, we just want that commitment uh, to earnings beats to send that along. But getting back to this chart, this is technology relative to the S&P 500. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the secular bull market began in April of 2013. That's when the S&P 500 broke out above the 2000, 2007 tops. So until you get that breakout on the S&P 500, you don't know if you're out of the prior secular bear market, which ran for 12 years or 12, 12 to 13 years. But once we got the breakout in the S&P 500, really almost from that point forward, technology has been a huge leader, the best by far, the best sector. So when you're in the secular bull market, this is, you want to, literally, you want to be overweight technology. Technology is about 24% of the S&P 500. So when we put our 10 equal weighted stocks together in our portfolios, a lot of times I'm shooting for three or four technology stocks because I want to consciously make that decision to have 30 or 40 percent of the portfolio in technology why well, this chart it tells us this this is the group if you get three or four leading technology stocks they're already in a leading industry group or excuse me a leading uh, um, sector so if you get four leading stocks three or four leading stocks within the leading sector I think you have a much, much better chance to outperform the S&P 500. And that's what we've done over the years. But when we went through this February through May period, you can see right here, technology underperformed. And so our strategy of overweighting these higher growth areas backfired. And it will backfire. Any growth-oriented portfolio will, will not do well when growth stocks don't do well. I mean, hopefully that kind of makes sense. But look at technology now. In our last quarter, our aggressive portfolio gained 27%. S&P was up 6%. How did we do well? Well, this was one of the big reasons. Technology has just been moving straight up. So you wanna at least be aware. It's broken out, it's now at a new high. Does this look to you like the market is worried about inflation? I don't see it. Inflation would eat away at future earnings. 
technology would not be leading the S&P 500 if Wall Street truly believed inflation was a problem. That's my point with this chart. Next up, consumer discretionary just broke out to an all-time high. Once again, you get a lot of growth stocks in consumer discretionary. You know, consumer spending makes up two-thirds of our GDP, or that's the estimate. So when you see consumer discretionary breaking out, it's telling us a couple things. Number one, not, inflated, not worried about inflation. And number two, we're in a strong economic expansion period. That's what this breakout tells me. When you get consumer discretionary stocks making new um, all-time highs on a relative basis to the S&P 500, that speaks volumes about the strength of the economy. So I'm you know, looking at these two charts, technology and consumer discretionary, and I'm just shaking my head when I read these headlines talking about you know, how the market's gonna fall because of inflation or the market's gonna fall because of the COVID variant. Um, Wall Street, you know, nobody's told Wall Street, I guess. Communication services. Now, this is a group that has been struggling, but it also was leading as of September. It was one of the leading groups. So it has completely seen rotation. I mean, you've got areas like broadcasting and entertainment. Think about uh, Disney um, not doing well. Think about, you know, some of the internet stocks that have done well and still are doing okay, but they've made such big runs that they're struggling on a relative basis now. Even a stock like Google, it's been such a great performer. Um, you know, Google has done basically what Amazon did a year ago. And I'm not saying Google can't go higher, but Google, and I can pull the chart up for you, but Google has made such a big run. And, you know, we got up to 3,000 a year ago, we were at 1,700. So we basically have doubled in the last year on Google. And if I pull up a weekly chart on Google, you can see that as it's made its recent high, look at the PPO, the weekly PPO is really poor. So it doesn't mean that we can't go higher, but I think the odds are increasing that Google is not going to be your leader going forward. I think the market goes higher, but I think we're just gonna, just like Google, you know, money rotated and Google was a leader for a while. I think we're seeing money rotate and I think you'll see other areas lead. I'm watching Amazon because I think Amazon is going to break back out again. And when it does, I think you got a new leader. Look at Amazon coming out of the, the March pandemic, March, 2020 lows. Amazon had a huge move, huge, 1,600 to 3,500 in six months. And now for the most part, we're about where we were then. And this is now 20 months later, or no, I guess maybe about 15 months later, 14, 15 months later. So I think after this period of consolidation, very much like this period of consolidation, when you get a breakout, probably gonna see a big run. So that's what I'd be looking for. So for me, I'm actually, you know, haven't seen the breakout yet, but when we get a breakout, I'd be more inclined to be in Amazon versus Google. So anyway, um, but let's go back over to these uh, relative strength charts just for another minute or two. And so that we were on communication services, which is going down. Now, yields are gonna have an impact on industrials and financials. And right now the yields going down, this, you know, I, I talked about discretionary stocks. Let's go back and show you one more thing here. I talked about discretionary stocks when, when the PPO, relative PPO got down to minus one. So this is just telling us that over, you know, a 12 to 26 week period, I mean, that's what the PPO is based on, 12, 26 right here. And it's a weekly chart. So over this period, the PPO, when it drops to minus one, if you look back historically, the last 10 years, certainly throughout the secular bull market, anytime the relative strength or the relative PPO has dropped to minus one on the XLY, that's when we've made these big moves. It's happened every time. And so I talked about this a month or two ago, and I explained this was one of the reasons why I really liked discretionary. Now, industrials, I'll tell you, over time, do not do as well relative to the S&P during a secular bull market as technology and consumer discretionary. So it's not to the same degree, but we are in a similar place right now with this minus one. You can see many of these bottoms came in at minus one. Now we did have the financial crisis that went lower, the pandemic, which went lower, but those were two outliers. This is really the only other time we have seen this relative PPO drop this low. 
This was back in um, 2011. And you can see what happened. The relative strength immediately picked up and we had a big move. I believe we're going to see another move back to the upside in the industrials. And I've been talking about it. it hasn't really worked, as you can see, we're moving lower, but I'm not giving up on it right now. We got yields falling, which definitely is not helping the industrial group. But I believe we're going to see a, a rebound. I think areas like transportation will do well going forward. And I think that'll help the industrials. Last one I'll show you here is financials. This is the last of the five aggressive sectors. And financials, like industrials, tend to move up when yields are going up. They tend to move down on a relative basis when yields are moving down. Right now, the relative PPO just at the center line, not really telling us a whole lot. But if yields move up, I would be looking for financials to at least get back up to this recent high. And when you look at the relative strength of financials since 2013, since the breakout, you can see we are basically going sideways. We're almost exactly where we were. So financials go for, along for the ride. Uh, industrials tend to go along for the ride. Technology, consumer discretionary, and communication services tend to lead. And that's why when you go back up here and we look at technology, we're not going sideways. We're going straight up. Big difference. Okay. Moving on, um, earnings spotlight. I just wanted to show you a couple charts. Um, and literally these are earnings that are gonna be coming out, um, either coming out later today or they may have just reported this morning. I don't have the uh, times reporting. These are all companies that will be reporting today, Tuesday. All right, so we got uh, CRM, salesforce.com. What I like to do is look at the relative strength of the stock relative to its peers to just start to get a feel for what Wall Street thinks about a company before they report their earnings. Right here, you know, Salesforce isn't the worst software stock out there, but it certainly isn't the best one. Um, I think they'll beat. I don't know that Wall Street is gonna go crazy. We'll see what kind of a number they come up with. What you wanna see from a bullish standpoint is an open above 310 uh, on Wednesday, because they do, I know CRM does report later today at the end of the day. Um, next up, BNS, this is one that does report this morning. I know this is a morning report. So this is the Bank of Nova Scotia, again, looking at a relative strength chart. Hasn't been one of the best stocks in the banking area. So Wall Street's just kind of ho-hum. And that's what I'm going to be. I'm not going to be overly excited going into their earnings report. Next up, Zscaler. I believe this is an afternoon report. This one has been a leader in software. So this is one I would expect a big number from. Doesn't always mean we're going to get a big reaction, to the upside, but I would expect that we're gonna see a very, very big um, um, beat in terms of revenue and, and earnings per share. I'd be surprised if we don't. Now, like um, uh, uh, salesforce.com, same principle applies here. I wanna see a breakout on the open. So if we can get up you know, above 370, especially over 375, uh, closer to 380, and you say, well, that's 20, 25 bucks. Well, you take a look at some of these companies when they report earnings. Uh, that wouldn't be, an, I mean, that's less than 10%. It's like maybe 7% move. That very easily could happen. Uh, but anytime you hold a stock into earnings, you're just taking on a big risk. You got to make, that's a personal decision for everyone. That's not a decision I or anyone else can make. Uh, you got to just decide if you're willing to hold because you could be down 7% just as easy, easily as you're up 8, uh, 7%. And you could be down 7% after blowing out earnings. I've seen some great reports and the stock just goes down. It's just a, a buy on rumor like this, sell on news. That's possible. So we got to be a little careful there. All right. Um, oh, I've run out of time here. I'm way past. Um, I tell you what, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you the three stocks. L-A-Z-R. These are the three you must see. Um, I just like the fact that gapped up with earnings is pulled back. X, which is uh, US, X, or US Steel, pulling back to a key gap support right in here near 23. And the last one I have LUMN, Lumen Technologies. Uh, I don't like the, the chart, the AD line, but watch that gap support level closer to 1260. All right, that's it for me. I appreciate everyone tuning in. Have a great day, everybody. And I'll be back Wednesday over at uh, earningsbeats.com for your next Trading Places Live. Happy trading. Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.